Our gracious Lord, we are thankful to you for letting us worship you, for the breath to praise your name, that we know that you're nearer than breath that we breathe, that you are our life. Thank you for letting us live this day. Thank you for letting us live it with your children. Thank you for all that we are learning of you, not merely for learning's sake, but for your namesake. We rejoice to know that we are caught up in the destiny of grace and that you are fulfilling your purposes to conform us to the image of your Son. Thank you, Father. We yield now that we might be used as instruments of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus our Lord. Amen. How many of you have come in today, joined us here today? Would you just raise your hand? Isn't that wonderful? Thank you so much. Where have you been? (laughs) Thank you. I hope all of you who've come today can stay. I hope that you'll, I know one or two that can't. Dave and Nana said they couldn't stay. I hope the Lord will speak to them again before they leave. Some of the rest of you may not be able to stay, but thank the Lord that all of you could come. I'm going to be using scriptures I move along, so I won't read any just now. My thesis tonight, my premise is this. Now, this is something you can check on, you can chew on, you can live with, you can count on. I'll stand with you before the throne of God and be responsible for this statement. In Jesus Christ, God changed the species of mankind. That's my statement. In Jesus Christ, God changed the species of mankind. The Bible offers no hope for you within yourself. The Bible offers no hope for you within yourself. Every level of life is destined to its own environment, to its own level within itself. Now, Henry Drummond deals with this very beautifully in his book on nature and the supernatural. I alluded to this the other day. I'll go ahead and illustrate the point. I don't know that I'll use his words exactly. Somehow, when words come through me, they take on an eastern North Carolina flavor. (laughs) But uh, to use my words of Henry Drummond's thought, it's this, that every level of life is hemetrically sealed and cannot lift itself out of itself. For instance, the, the level of minerals are destined within themselves to remain mineral. They can't change themselves. But vegetable can be dropped down into the mineral order. And as the corn drops down into the mineral order, and the minerals die out to the corn, the corn dies out in the minerals, the minerals are caught up in a new realm we call the vegetable realm. And here comes a stalk of ground, uh, corn, that represents those minerals that before were sealed until a high order came down in it. Now that corn can grow on up and look around and uh, happen to see a beautiful cow or wish that it was an animal. But you can't, a corn can't change its nature. Corn is destined to remain uh, corn until 
the old cow leans over the fence and the corn yields up to the cow. The cow reaches down to the corn and pulls it up into the animal realm. Amazing, isn't it? All of a sudden, here are minerals, change the vegetables, change the animals. Then one of these cows, maybe you think I've got the wrong gender, sees a Methodist preacher riding around, maybe an evangelist. Says, I wish I could be an evangelist. Well, really, that, that cow can't be an evangelist. Unless its owner uh, kills a nice young calf and invites um, an evangelist for supper. Uh, and as that animal dies out and the preacher goes down to it, all of a sudden there's some bull becoming preacher. <laughs> You wondered how it happened, didn't you? <laughs> now, these are rather graphic uh, and uh, limited illustrations of a, of a real basic principle of revelation. And God is not mad with humanity. Uh, he's not mad because you're you. But the simple truth of the matter is, you have limitations. You are not a limitless being within yourself. You will ever be a human being, and a rather ordinary one, which is wonderful. Thank God for that we're ordinary human beings. There's nothing wrong with that. I find more people frustrated because they're ashamed of being an ordinary person. They feel like they've got to be a person. They've got to be an extraordinary one. Very few of those. Only 7%, really, are exceptional, I'm told. Don't, don't hold before your children, ordinary parents, all of these tremendous pressures that they've got to be perfect and they've got to be extraordinary. Praise God. That only 7% are extraordinary on the high level, about that percentage extraordinary on the low level. That leaves 86% ordinary, run of the mill. That's most of us and most of our children. Let them rejoice in being ordinary human beings. God loves them. But they are that. And to be able to accept the fact that within yourself you're destined to be a human being so far as you're concerned. But that's not the final answer. God has made, her, made us to be more than we are. And he doesn't give us a self-help, do-it-yourself George kit. Uh, but he follows this same principle. And we find in the incarnation the movement of life is the higher comes to the lower. That's the movement of the incarnation. Incidentally, that's the theological basis of an anti-poverty program. If you don't think that makes good sense and you wish preachers would hush, you better know your Christian theology. Christian theology is that the higher moves to the lower. That the top moves to the root system. And so God knowing our limitations, hasn't waited for us to come to him, hadn't waited for you to perfect yourself and say, look me over, Lord, and see that I'm all right. He knows you aren't. And so since you can't go to him, he comes to you. Since you can't become what he is within yourself, he becomes what you are within himself. And in Jesus Christ, God lets himself down in our midst. I picked up a fellow one day, one Monday morning, and um, he looked me over. And he said, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, yes, I don't ever tell people I'm a preacher unless they really ask me. And then sometimes, one, for instance, I asked one fellow I was riding on the plane, I said, what, what's your line of work? And I don't, I don't tell them because when they find out you're preachers, they clam up. And I left, you know, talk with folks. 
So I said, what's your line of work? He said, I'm an interior decorator. Well, I said, that's my field. <laughs> <laughs> he discovered we went to different schools <laughs> I had to tell him I was dealing with different buildings <laughs> and he rather liked that but anyway this fellow looked me over and said you're a preacher aren't you and I said yes sir I am he brightened right up he said I am too well I said did you preach yesterday he said I preached four times well, I said, how many people did you preach to yesterday? Well, he said, in all, I suppose I preached about 2,000 people. I said, my goodness, man, what did you preach? They bring out that many people. Well, he said, I took my text over in Genesis. He said, uh, I read there where God taught, walked with Adam in the cool of the day and said, I held my finger right at that point and said, I asked the people, how do you think God got down from heaven down to the garden? Said the Bible doesn't say, but we're going to conjecture at this point. Now he said, I'm pretty sure he didn't have any Cadillac. And I don't imagine he rode a horse. Said he could have done it most anyway, but it might have been this way. Said God might have reached over and got himself a great, big, beautiful, soft cloud. Made himself a chair and sat down in it then reached over and got another cloud and made himself a footstool and propped it under his feet. And then reached over and got another cloud and made himself a pillow and put it under his head and came rocking on down to earth on his own glory. And I said, brother, if I had an imagination like that, I'd preach to 2,000. <laughs> a lot of things that we aren't told about the details. But the incarnation does tell us that God himself, the Logos, the Word, became man and didn't become half man, half God, became perfect man as well as perfect God. And on the manward side, tempted in every point as we're tempted, standing every test that we have stood, and wherein we have failed. For if you failed in one of the laws, you've broken the whole law. Let me illustrate that point. I got out of the car one day, and Frances said, do you want to lock the car? And I said, yes, darling, be sure the door's locked. She did. We went on. We came back to the car. I unlocked her side, went around and unlocked my door, and I hadn't locked it. Three car, three doors out of four were locked. One was unlocked. The whole car was open. You've broken one law, you've broken them all. Don't take so much pride on keeping the seventh one, missing out on the ninth one. Uh, one law has broken them all. The word of God says we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. You're wonderful, but you're not what God had in mind when he made man. God has something better than you. <laughs> has something better for you. Has something better for me. Has something better than me. And that something better is Jesus. And if you want to know what God had in mind when he made man, look at Jesus. Look him over. And you'll see him, see him in his radiant splendor as a man uh, who was without sin and yet who counted himself as nothing. Wasn't worried about any reputation. Isn't that amazing? When you've got it, you don't have to worry about it. It's those of us who don't have one always trying to get one. <laughs> uh, when, when you've really got the reputation, you don't have to worry about keeping it. You can't lose what you've really got if it comes from God. That which really belongs to God will never be lost. Remember that one too. That just came through. That which really belongs to God will never be lost. Uh, so Jesus Christ wasn't worried about a reputation, divested himself of his glory, and as a man learned through love 
that his highest privilege in life was to stay in union with his father on the inside. Now, this is what God had intended all the while. Had intended for man to be mastered from within, in love. And as man yielded by sitting at his feet from within, as man yielded and was mastered by the Spirit from within, then his outward life would manifest the inward mastery. All of outward life is made so that it reproduces what man is on the inside. You can live with that one too. All of the outward world is so made that it reproduces what man is on the inside. This is why it's rather tragic to try to immortalize the mess we're in. What is the use of, you know, adding a hundred years on to our life when we don't know how to live the 60? You know, it's rather futile, isn't it? Just to keep adding year on year on year on year if that's all we're adding. It's rather futile, isn't it, to transplant our mess to the moon. I'm glad we've gone to the moon. I'm excited about it. We've, I really believe a new era is dawning on mankind. But I really was in prayer all last week and shall be from now on that none of us as human beings will ever get on the moon or any other planet unless we go like the angels came bearing goodwill. I hope we'll never transplant selfishness and greed and all of the anxieties and fe fears to one of these other precious planets. Uh, this one cost the blood of God's own son because of that. Wonder what it would cost if we transplant the mess. Uh, so in all this space travel, let's, pray, let's really pray we'll travel in the spirit and get CFOs going to the moon. <laughs> are, are we prepared for it? You don't have any anxieties here this week, do you? You're just as free, aren't you? Loving everybody, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> of course you aren't. <laughs> uh, you see, just having the label CFO doesn't do the trick. CFOs are human beings with needs just like non-CFOs, just like us Methodists. Uh, just like you Baptists and oh, I left the Presbyterians out the other night. All of us, you see, regardless of these labels, we happen to be human beings first. And so we all have the, the humanity in common. Regardless of culture or color or creed, we were all human beings first. And it's wonderful to know that regardless of the outward differences, we have humanity in common. Even geographical boundaries or national boundaries don't change it. The crosses in us have humanity in common, don't we? The Canadians, the Mexicans, and all the rest have humanity in common. Uh, the, what about the red Chinese? Any difference between them and the yellow Chinese? How about North Vietnamese? Any difference between them and South Vietnamese? It's amazing, isn't it, how we let geographical boundaries change our understanding of humanity. How about Russia? Much, any difference between Russians and English, human nature-wise? You'll find the same sort of babies being born in Russia, just like the babies we've got here at this camp. Mamas rock them. Daddies fuss with them. Mamas protect them. Preachers preach at them, <laughs> even underground. <laughs> all this humanity in common and God identified with it whose flesh did he take when he became man he took my flesh didn't he take yours do you know anybody's he didn't take do you, do you really think there's anybody in the world whose flesh God didn't identify with and so becoming this man he became not only a man, but he became man, corporate man, for all man. It's God bringing forth new man. And on this manward side, 
where the first Adam had failed really to live in union with his father. The second Adam, though he was tempted to go that route, he, he stayed in union in love. And this love affair between the son and the father, if you haven't caught that in the scriptures, I think that's one reason we have the New Testament, is let us in on the secret, the greatest love affair in the universe. And we read Playboy, Think that's love? Boy, young people, if you really want to know what love is, old folks too, uh, read the Gospels if you want to know what love is and catch this love between the Father and the Son. Uh, we are so perverted in our concept of love that even to talk about two men loving one another, you know, makes you lift your eyebrows. That's how perverted we are. But the New Testament is dealing with infinite love where Jesus the man really has love for God his Father on the inside and the two are made one by love and because he loves his Father he doesn't even want a thought of his own. Isn't that amazing? Never tried to inform his Father. Never hear Jesus say, Now Father, you know how much this family needs this boy. Father, you know how much Martha and Lazarus love their brother. Uh, Father, you know that he served as deacon of First Church. Uh, you never hear Jesus praying that way. He never tried to tell the Father. He listened. Let the Father tell him. What he heard his Father say, he'd speak. Brought a woman to him. Father, what have you got to say about it? He listened. What he heard was, he spoke. Where are thine accusers, woman? No man, Lord. Well, I don't condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Thy sins are forgiven thee. He heard his father. A man with a withered arm. He didn't fall down and say, Now, Father, I know you're trying to teach this man some great spiritual truth. Let me in on it. Tell me what his sin is. This is awfully dangerous, trying to figure out people's sickness by knowing their sins. That'll backfire on you. It'll make you their judge. Before you know it, you're playing God to sick folks. Uh, you're not a medical man. That's a medical approach. Don't try to be medical people unless you are a medical man. Leave the practice of medicine to doctors of medicine. Don't ever tell a person to stop wearing the glass, glasses or stop taking their drugs or stop uh, wear, uh, using their crutch or take off their brace. You didn't put it on them. Don't take it off of them. You're not ministering on that level. That's the medical world. Jesus never dealt in that world. He reveals a whole new approach. A whole new ministry is being dealt with here in his response to the Father. So as he comes up with a man with a withered arm, he doesn't analyze the cause on the level of karma. He looks beyond that to his Father and says, Father, what, what, what do I see in terms of this man's relationship with you? And he sees Father as Creator. And he sees a new arm in his father. And so he says to the man, stretch forth your hand. Now what hand did the man stretch forth? The withered hand or the one Jesus saw? You answer that one. Here's a man named Simon. He'd been given this label by the world. And the world has a way of labeling folks. What's the world labeled you? You're identified with it? A lot of us do. We, we yield to these various labels. Be careful how you use them. But the old boy had been named Shiftless One. A reed, Simon. His daddy, Mr. Johnson, had named him that. Simon, son of Johnson, son of Jonah. And so, uh, so John's son, son of John. Uh, so Simon Johnson was his name. Uh, in our language, uh, shiftless. And he lived up to it pretty well. 
You know, people have a way of responding to what you expect of them. You find somebody that, you know, sort of expects you to act like a Christian before you know it. Uh, you're whispering when you fuss. You don't want them to know you fuss. One difference between a preacher and a layman are we pull down our windows when we fuss. <laughs> we don't want the parishioners to know it. It's a sight, isn't it? Um, one difference between us and, and ordinary men who get jobs. Uh, we don't talk with the board about our salary. We go out and pray. <laughs> Hope the board will discover what jewels we are. Why don't we have a right to talk with the board about a salary? If that's the, you know, if the board has decided that's the way they're going to pay us, would you businessmen take a job with the company and get around to the salary and all say, I'll excuse myself while you all talk it over. Whatever you decide on, be all right with me. I bet school teachers don't get a salary that way. See, but we uh, somehow or another we sort of tie all this in, act as if because we are so-called spiritual, we aren't supposed to be down to earth. It's amazing, isn't it? So all of these wonderful quirks get involved here, and we yield to all these labels. And old, old Simon yielded to the label, and he stood before Jesus one day. Jesus has been praying for Simon. You know Jesus prayed for you. Do you know Jesus has got a name for you? It may be the one your family gave you. It may not be. You've got a new name written down in glory. That song is not just a gospel chorus. It's the truth. It may be it's a gospel chorus too. But he, Simon stood before him. Jesus had heard the Father on the inside of him. And he said, Simon... You've received that label from the world. You've responded to it. Uh, but you've got a new name. And your name is Peter. A rock. Rocky Johnson. <laughs> and on this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell not prevail against it. Now, did Jesus look down through the mess and see the rock? Or did Jesus look at his father and see the new creation and transpose the rock? You see, I hear people every once in a while say to me, Oh, I love the Christ in you. And I say, Why shouldn't you? But what about me? Now, where does that leave me? Anybody ought to love the Christ. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is better than that. It's not because God looked down through the mess and saw the Christ. You see, that's trying to find some justification for love. Oh, oh just close your eyes to the outward. That really doesn't work. Close your eyes to it and just see the Christ. The word of God is that while we were yet sinners... God commended his love toward us that he died for us. He didn't look down and see something in me and forget the bad. He saw me, bad, good, and indifferent and otherwise, and says, oh, buddy, I love you anyhow. I love you just like you are. And I love you so much that I'd rather take your sins and myself than to hold you responsible for them. That's involvement. Getting down in the nitty gritty of deliverance. None of this ivory tower in a gooey corner talking about the Christ. We're dealing with humanity that's broken, that's sinful, that's sordid, that needs redemption, that is deceitful, and yet that is loved by God. And that's us. That's what we're dealing with. And if you're afraid to get your hands dirty, you better stay from around Jesus. God gets his hands dirty in Jesus. And Jesus Christ never starts loving people on the basis of some merit within them. 
but on the basis of his father's love. And so he doesn't go around ministering on the level of symptoms. Jesus is not symptom-minded. He's not ministering salve to a sore. He's father-minded. He's person-centered. And he ministers life to persons. That's the ministry of Jesus. Not salve to sores, but life to persons. And that life is the life of his father. Boy, this is real. This is right down where we are. Jesus has our number. He knows what makes us tick. And he knows how to pick the ticks off too. (laughs) (laughs) This wonderful Lord. And you see him living this life out in union with his father and not, not claiming anything for himself. They ask him, How, where do you get all those good sermons? You ask me where, where, you, where I get mine, and oh, I'll be real nice and say, you know, oh, the Lord, give them to me. But in the meantime, if you watch me real closely, I'll start looking as wise as a tree full of owls, make you think I've got something. Where'd you get your sermons, Jesus? How'd you learn to preach like that, Lord? They aren't my sermons. I've just listened to the Father. What I hear my Father say, I repeat. Lord, how'd you perform miracles like that? I don't do them. I keep my eyes on my Father. What I see my Father do, I just reproduce. See, what he was on the inside. Young people, this is telling it like it is. Uh, This is what we're all crying for is to be on the outside what we are on the inside. And if we don't have it on the inside, to stop pretending we have it on the outside. Jesus never went around saying, I just love everybody. He didn't just love everybody. He loved anybody. In terms of specifics. And that love was not based on principle, but based on person. So that love has many manifestations. He loved the people that he drove out of the temple. Love has anger in it. Be angry and sin not. Do you think that love is just peace? I just love. Now, you better reread the Gospels. Jesus runs the gamut of emotional response and is in love one time as much as he is another. And you can drive money changers out of the temple if you're ready to die for them. He was ready to die for them too. Every man, he died. You can call a man a whited sepulcher, like a tomb, whitewashed on the outside, but on the inside, you stink. You can talk like that if you're ready to die for them. But if love is just some way where you live off in a corner and live in an idea of love, you can't afford to tell the truth. You've got to act like everything smells good. And it doesn't. And we're living in a world where it all doesn't smell good. And we need to love enough to be able to face the dirt, not by slinging mud, but by washing feet. Oh, glory. And you can afford to see the mud if you're carrying a basin and towel. You see, this is the reason we, you know, just party out a deal around. Because we don't really have the goods. And we're afraid that somebody might catch up with us. That we're not able to produce. This Lord Jesus Christ was in union with his Father. And so he reproduced after the order of that which he saw on the inside. And as he did, he could honestly say, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. For he reproduced clearly on the outward what he saw clearly on the inward. 
he reproduced the father because he kept his eyes on his father. Another wonderful thing he showed me, and that is he wouldn't let anything break this union with his father. I hear some people saying they don't have time to stay in union. Oh, if I just, when my, when my children get out of school, and I don't have to get them off to school. Uh, you know, when, when I can really get to my feet on the ground so I can hire somebody to open up the business a little before early, and I, I can afford to stay home and uh, have a few hours. Uh, or when this happens, when my mother is healed and I don't have to wait on her. Uh, when all of this, what is your excuse for not staying in union with Jesus? How many hours a day do you have? How, how, many, how many less hours a day do you have than Jesus had? Is your mission in life more demanding than his? Is yours more important than his? And as important and demanding as his mission was, he refused to let anything claim precedence over his inward union with his father. Sometimes he had to stay up all night to do it. Sometimes he had to really run the risk of losing friends to do it. It's amazing the tie of sentiment, especially on Christian friends. I've done this over and over again. You know, my schedule get too heavy anyhow. And I realize I'm neglecting my family and I'm whipping myself some about that and Old boy calls me that I love so much, went to school with, I've prayed with him, we've, you know, done all this. Uh, Tommy, oh, come on over, give me just three days. Well, let me check my calendar. <laughs> and before I know it, I've given him the only three days I've got, just on the basis of human sentiment. Jesus had a message like that. Arona came up. Jesus, the girls want you very badly. He didn't even ask what girls. He knew, you know, I don't know that the Bible, uh, the Bible doesn't say that. Don't know. I'm reading into it at that point, but I'm just paraphrasing. The, the girls want you. What's wrong? Lazarus is real sick. He's at the point of death. They need you. He didn't say, tell them I'm coming right on. He said, uh, let me go to my father. Father, you know that I want to go. You know how good those girls have been to me. That's my second home, Lord. Isn't it wonderful, these homes away from home, Thelma and Marsh? <laughs> uh, you know, you just, uh, all the, these wonderful homes. And Jesus loved these girls, loved them dearly. Uh, they just catered to him. And everybody loves to be loved. And, uh, but Lord, I, I, I can't afford to go on the basis of past fellowship, but on the basis of present obedience. I, is this what you want? And his father says, no, son, not yet. But Lord, a father, I want to. I, they need me. But I need you, father, uh, son. I've got something to show you. Now get along with me. All right, tell them I'll come as soon as I can. I don't know when that is exactly. And by the time he got there, they, they were pretty much up in the air. And you can bet your life when she said, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She didn't say it. If thou hadst been here, my brother even now would be alive. Boy, fire was in her eyes. Jesus, where have you been? Now, he's dead. It's too late now. But if you'd have come on when we sent your word, he wouldn't have died. L Lord, you've let us down. You're capable of letting me down. You ever have anybody tell you that? I did. Well, we do. We have to learn those lessons. But so, you ever feel like God let you down? I did. Two or three times. I told him so. <laughs> but he always showed me he knew better. Just like he showed my. But you see, he wouldn't let human sentiment break that tie. He stayed in union with his father. And his father reproduced in the man Jesus the fullness of all that he'd intended. Now, he comes down to the end of his life, and he does this, incidentally, not over in a corner somewhere. God is not interested in operating in a corner. What God does, he does in the midst of humanity. 
Please know this. God does not have secret fraternities. I'm not against secret orders if you belong to one. Don't misunderstand me. All I'm saying is that's man and not God. A God that really doesn't develop an exclusive club. If you happen to belong, well, that's your business. But that, you know, God operates in the midst of humanity. And this, this new man that he produced was done in relationship with all mankind and especially 12. I assume there were 12 personality types there. I assume there was a Leo, David. <laughs> David Skeen and I, and I have the same birthday. That's the day. This is the first day of Leo. We, we roar, we just don't bite. Uh, I assume that uh, there's something to all of that. There, there are basic, 12 basic personality types that may represent the 12 tribes. I don't know. But oh, you just do all of that numerology bit you want. I'm not quite geared that way. Uh, but Jesus had 12 disciples. And he had just about every kind you can imagine. Which kind are you? And he produced this life in fellowship with them. Don't you wish you could get rid of some folks? Couldn't you be a better Christian if you, had, if you could get along without living beside somebody? What about if you had a preacher like me or Dave? Couldn't you be a better Christian than with the pastor you have? <laughs> you, you bet your life you couldn't. We're always wishing, you know, if my wife loved me like John's wife loved him. You know? Or if I, had, if I had my finances taken care of like that old boy. Or if I had this or if I had that, I'd have it made. We're always wishing we could get rid of something out here somewhere. Jesus was tempted to be like that. These boys grated on his nerves. Every once in a while he'd say, how long do I have to put up with this? <laughs> How long do I have to deal with you? Oh, faithless generation. Uh, he was tempted and put up with stuff like us. And it's in the setting of stuff like us that the new life was and is produced. And if you get rid of the neighbor you have, the next one you'll get to be just like him. And you'll keep getting the same neighbor until you learn to deal with him. Any of you girls will often left your husbands. The chances are the one you got now is just, just like the first. And he's probably told you, I want you to know I'm not your first husband. And he, you've probably said, well, you act like him. Uh, you'll keep getting him until you learn to deal with him. Amazing. Uh, God's work is done right down in the setting of humanity. And that's where Jesus produced the new man. And then toward the end, he called the twelve to him. And he said, fellas, I've got to go away and leave you. Now, this is a screen, if you read it between the lines. And listen, in, you know, the Bible says as much by what it doesn't say as it does by what it does say. Uh, and you don't have to stretch it, uh, you know, way out of context. Uh, here were, he was with James and John. They were, they were there and some of the other fellows. He said, boys, we've come to the end of the road. What do you mean, Lord? I, I, well, I've got to leave you. I'm going to leave you. Where are you going, Lord? Well, I'm going into another realm where you can't go. We're going to have to be separated. What do you mean separated? Well, that's right. I, I'm not going to be with you. I'm leaving you. I'm going into another dimension, and you can't go with me. They, st you know, they start to ask questions, then it hit them. Lord, you can't do this. Now, we're, we're just learning. We, we hadn't said much about it. Our mother got in on it. She wanted one of us to be, you know, general and one admiral. But no one said on your eye. We didn't say much about that, Lord. But we have paid a price to follow you. We've been called kooks. Our own minister hadn't understood us. They rotated us off the board. <laughs> All of that. 
We've just been flopping nights, called the emotional scum, running around after an itinerant healer. It wasn't respectable, you know. It was very unrespectable. And we, but we haven't said much about that. We, we, we know that you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. And we're willing to do some things that ought to, ought to be identified with you. But Lord, we were in business with our daddy. And we had a pretty good thing going too. The old boys, they'd forgotten. They were mending their nets when he called them. You ever hear anybody talking about how much they had to give up to follow Jesus? It doesn't impress me. I don't care what you've had to give up to follow. I do care. But regardless of what you've had to give up to follow Jesus, that which you've gotten back is worth infinitely more. Now, at that time, Peter came in on the scene. Old, impetuous, precious boy. He might have been a Leo. <laughs> he had ego enough to be one. <laughs> uh, watch this, boys. You know, couldn't stay out of anything. They told him what was happening. He looked at Jesus with fire in his eyes. Jesus, now you, you've taught us uh, to love one another. You've taught us to stay open and truthful with one another. Now, Lord, I'm going to tell it like it is. You can't do it. Now, that, it's just not right. There's, now, we have paid the price, and we, we'll do it over again. But now, Lord, there's, my case is different. <laughs> Now, I, I, you know I have a family, and I've run around over this country following you for these three years, and I haven't said much about it, but you haven't forgot to have you, Lord. My wife's mother lives with us. <laughs> and there, uh, there's been a lot of arguments at our house. You went home with me, she worked herself into a fever, and you had to heal her. <laughs> now, you expect me to go back and say, Jesus has left us? I'll not do it. Besides, the Messiah is not supposed to die. The Christ can't die. That's when he called him Satan. When he said the Christ couldn't die. Get thee behind me, Satan. You don't understand the things that are God. For this purpose was I born, for this cause came on to the world. And Jesus Christ then said to his disciples, and you know, I imagine they were sitting out maybe around an old country store someplace. They didn't have Pepsis. Maybe they had some lemonade, you reckon? <laughs> Limeade or something. I hear somebody saying a glass of wine. <laughs> I'm sure that's what they did have. A glass. But anyway, uh, I, in my mind, I see a, uh, about a half bag of wheat sitting out there. You know, Jesus uses all of this natural world. It's amazing how observant he is. There's a song that says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It, it ain't so. Things of earth will grow strangely clear. Jesus gives you vision. You know, I never noticed how pretty close, uh, how, how pretty clothes were until I really got in the spirit and I just love to see people wearing pretty clothes Ruth you look so pretty tonight <laughs> uh, and, and when I say that I'm not just flattering folks I'm responding to beauty I, every night I've just marvel at the artistic beauty with which this cross has been decorated it, it's not only symbolic but it's beautiful the colors have been there. It's been edifying to see it. Here's the grape and the vine analogy all tied into the Calvary. Well, that grows strangely clear. That's not dim. Jesus observed it. He watched those setting hens clucking. You city folks missed out on that one. You ever watch an old setting hen and when a storm is coming, cluck, 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 you know and call those biddies under a wing. And you ever see her, you know, squat out over them? Jesus watched it. He stood outside Jerusalem. How I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her brood under a wing. 
Why, he'd watched them. He'd watched lilies grow. He'd watched birds fly. He observed the universe around him. So here was a bag of wheat, about a half a bag. He picked up a handful and let it run down through his hands. You ever, you ever let a handful of wheat run down through your fingers? You wonder why these precious young people left to go barefooted. For one reason, they weren't raised in the country when I was. <laughs> <laughs> but for another reason there's a call of nature in their hearts and somehow God is trying to let us know this world isn't made for the devil it's not made for wars it's not made for greed it's not made for animosity it's not made for selfishness this is my father's world and it's made for righteousness and love and light. And God is calling us to appreciate the world and quit releasing on it all of the unholy things. So these young kids going around barefooted because they feel something coming up through the dirt. You're having nerve trouble? Get out here in this beautiful section of Ohio in the spring of the year and ask some farmer to let you follow his plow for half a day. Just walk out through the fields. Let the soft dirt come up through your toes. It might be better than a whole year's counseling program. I was over at Canuga. I'm going back in a few weeks. I haven't been there in several years. Canuga is the Western North Carolina Episcopal Conference Center where the CFO meets there. A lady came that was having a nervous breakdown. I didn't know anything about breakdowns. Since I've had my own, I know more. <laughs> I, I, I'm just sort of a nervous breakdown going around happening. <laughs> ha happening with other folks. It's wonderful to have your emotions healed and your nerves healed in context with other people. So I don't believe psychotics can heal psychotics. Isn't it terrible to have to put a psychotic in a ward with just other psychotics and say, now psychotics, heal yourselves. Neurotics, when you, you know the difference between neurotic and psychotic? A neurotic says, four and four make nine. That's a neurotic. Psychotic says, four and four make eight, and I just can't stand it. Uh, that's one of Agnes Sanford's stories. You, you don't live on mine, her level of humor. <laughs> Maybe it's too late in the night. <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't know much about praying for, for nervous breakdown cases. And the idea came to me, so I said to her, let's come out here behind St. Francis Chapel. We went out there where that little stream is behind St. Francis Chapel. We took off our shoes, sat out there under the law bushes, and let the water run over our feet for a couple of hours. And I told her stories of love, wonderful stories of love, while we sat and let water run over our feet. In two hours' time, a miracle of healing had happened. It's amazing. If we lived half as close as nature to nature, as we do the drugstore, we'd have a lot better health and more money too. Uh, get close to the world, Jesus did. And he picked up this grain of wheat. I'll get to my story. I hope you get all these little sermons. <laughs> so many side trips, aren't they? <laughs> these are my pointless sermons. And he let that wheat fall down through his hands and held back a few grains. Now he said, fellas, here, 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 here it is. He said, a wheat, a grain here is, is a fulfillment of the law. I'm paraphrasing. He didn't say this literally. I'm reading into it, but it's there. He could have said it. I'll tell you when I'm picking up his words. A grain, a, a, a grain of wheat is the fulfillment of the law that produced it. The purpose of clearing the ground. 
the purpose of plowing the ground, the purpose of planting the seed, the purpose of all of the toil that went into it was to produce it. This seed, it's the fulfillment of the law that went to produce it. That's that way with me. The purpose of Moses, the purpose of Elijah, the purpose of, of Amos, the, the purpose of Obadiah, the purpose of Nahum, the purpose of all of these, the purpose of all Israel was to produce me. I'm the seed. I'm the fulfillment of the law that went to produce me. Now he said, you can take a seed and keep it like it is indefinitely. Under the right conditions, it'll, re it'll retain its fertility. Now it's that way with me. I could keep on living with you. I have life within myself. Don't ever blame the devil for killing Jesus. Don't blame man for killing Jesus. Thank God for Pope John XXIII for so many different reasons. But one thing he said to the world, stop blaming the Jews for killing Jesus. And this is true. Don't blame people for killing Jesus. Uh, the cross was not conceived in the mind of man, nor in the mind of Satan. The cross was conceived in the mind of God. Jesus told the disciples that on the Emmaus Road, if you want to read the story. Starting with Moses, the Pentateuch, he told them how it was that Christ should have come. Christ should have been crucified. Christ should have died and be raised from the dead. He came into the world in order to die. So he said, I have life within myself. No man takes my life from me. No, I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. Now he said, just like with a grain of wheat, except that grain drops into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it drops into the ground and dies, the fulfillment of the first law becomes the beginning of a new law. And as it dies, it brings forth a new dimension. And in bringing forth a new dimension, it multiplies itself beyond measure. Now he said, it's that way with me. I could keep living with you, but in association, I could only tell you something of how to preach as I preach, how to pray as I pray, how to walk as I walk, but not to be what I am. I become what you are that you might become what I am. But in order for this to happen, I've got to go through the death process. And when I go through the death process, I'm going to come forth again in a new dimension. And when I've come forth in that new dimension, I'm going to come forth with the ability to reproduce myself on the inside of you. Oh, glory. So this perfect man, this man of man, uh, gave himself not only in obedience to his father to fulfill the perfect creative purpose of God, but then gave himself through death that he might come forth in new dimensions that he might share the new humanity with us. And this is what it's all about, Alfie. And we'll talk more about it in the morning from this point. Do you have any questions on what I've said? Does it make sense to you now when I say, in Jesus, God changed the species of mankind? Let us pray. Our Father, we're glad to be who we are. We're not proud of the failures that we have, nor the sins we've committed. But we're glad because if we weren't human beings, we could never be sons of God. We thank you that your, your son became one with us, that we might become one with you. Oh, praise thy name that it's redeemed humanity that we're concerned with here. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for becoming one with us. And now we know we've already shared with you something of your resurrected glory. But for the remainder of this count, bring us to that realm of resurrection in ways we've never dreamed possible. 
not by our own striving, but by your own achievement. Thank you, Lord. Amen.